Okay, um, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, low voltage scanning electron microscopy. Uh, I'm Chris Butcher. I'm one of the uh, technical staff at the Canadian Centre for Electron Microscopy. So I've been involved in microscopy for quite a few years. So I've seen everything from when we had tubes and SEMs to uh, modern day uh, equipment. So when we're talking about uh, low voltage scanning electron microscopy, it's different from sort of conventional SEM. We're going to need fairly specific equipment and techniques in order to uh, do this. And we're going to be working at beam energies below uh, 5 kV um, or equal to that. So here you can see a nice picture of uh, a catalyst. Uh, this is taken at low KV uh, with um, some stage bias, so beam deceleration, with a through-the-lens uh, detector. So this is at 800,000 times magnification. So the requirements for low-voltage SEM, you're going to need a field emission gun. We need to have enough output at low KV, and we also need high-performance lens systems so that we can actually image uh, the uh, different uh, electrons that we're using uh, for this, so both the secondary electrons, backscatter electrons. And the detectors themselves have to be high efficiency because we're very dependent, especially in uh, uh, secondary electron imaging mode on the efficiency of the detectors. Um, and you need to be able to detect things at low KV. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about EDS today. Um, mainly what you need in that case is usually enough large area detectors to detect enough uh, X-rays at low KV. And you may even need to have a windowless detector system in order to sort of differentiate some of the very uh, low energy X-ray peaks that show up. Now, some optional extras that might not be on any all your uh, field emission uh, electron microscopes will be electron beam deceleration. So in the case of the Magellan 400, we have uh, we can bias the stage. Uh, in, or, or in, in that case, the sample of its uh, conductive to uh, decelerate the beam. Uh, we also have a monochromator on the Magellan 400, uh, which we can use to uh, reduce the sort of beam energy spread uh, so we get further resolution. And we can uh, extend the final uh, lens uh, into the uh, uh, sample and give us a, a little better uh, resolution. Uh, additionally, there are things that in the software which can be quite a help uh, when you're doing uh, imaging, such as drift correction. You can do averaging. Um, and uh, one of the main things we actually use uh, in the software is when we're taking pictures, we quite often do integration in order to uh, reduce the exposure of samples to the electron beam. So I'll just do um, a brief sort of overview of uh, some of the things that are going on with uh, electron beam interactions with samples. So we have our primary electron beam uh, coming down. And from that, we're getting various things being produced. So we're going to be, when we're talking about imaging, going to be talking about secondary electrons and backscattered electrons. So uh, the secondary electrons are produced by inelastic collisions and tend to have fairly low energy. The backscattered electrons are elastic collisions and have the energy of the primary beam. There will be some other things produced. Um, and, but we're not at the moment concerned with those sort of things. 
Now, when we're considering a primary beam of 5 kV that produces 5 keV electrons. So the depth to which those electrons penetrate, you can calculate here. And in the chart here, you can see at 5 keV, the sort of depth and different types of materials. So the, when the beam hits, you're going to have a volume of interaction. Um, and you'll get secondaries from up near the top here. So because we're dealing with very low voltages, we're going to tend to be uh, fairly shallow. Um, and the backscatter electrons would be a little bit deeper, but also because we are doing low KV, they're not going to be going very deep. And the same with X-rays. So Now, one of the things that's used for doing a lot of simulations when you're trying to figure out that sort of interaction volume are uh, Monte Carlo simulations which can be very useful uh, for calculating things. Now, when we're talking about the actual electroelectrons hitting the sample and the actual interaction volume, as we decrease the KV of the electron beam, uh, we are going to get a decrease in the size of the interaction volume. Uh, these are Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and it's going to be very restricted to the near surface or surface of the sample. So a lot of the information you're going to be getting is going to be very surface oriented. And also because we're not talking about a great distance to the surface, there's more chance for the electrons to escape and actually be detected by our detectors. Here you can see the material we're working with is carbon. Now, uh, in the Magellan, we do have two types of secondary electron detectors. Uh, we have a through the lens detector, and we have an Everhart Thornley detector off, and off to the side uh, for detecting things from the sample. So as the beam comes down, we get different types of electrons produced. So we get what are called SE1s from the primary beam. Uh, we get SE2s from any sort of backscatter electrons that are produced um, in the sample or from other surfaces. Um, and um, the SE2s uh, can sometimes cause a lot of problems in that uh, they contribute to the signal you may be detecting in the various detectors. The SE3s, which are from other surfaces like the uh, outside of the lens or the surfaces within the microscope, uh, can also contribute to that as well. But at lower KV, there tends to be a lot less uh, backscatter electrons produced. So uh, usually the SE3 contribution uh, is much less. Now, as I was saying before, in the Magellan, we have a final lens that we can sort of extend out towards the specimen. Um, so do immersion mode. This gives us sort of a electrostatic lens in between the uh, pole piece and the uh, specimen, which further enhances our resolution. But also we can apply a uh, voltage to the stage and if the specimen is conductive, uh, the specimen. Uh, and we can also use that to create a lens between the final uh, aperture and the uh, specimen. So there's a bunch of things we can do to make a sort of, a, as it were, a virtual lens between the two systems. Uh, our backscatter detector fits underneath uh, the final aperture uh, and sits above. So. When we're talking about um, the voltage that the sample is actually seeing, we're going to be talking about the landing energy. Because we can do things like, um, as we saw in the previous thing, uh, we can do uh, beam deceleration. We can actually affect the landing energy of the electrons on the actual sample. So 
you'll see in quite a lot of the images that we do use um, this beam deceleration to actually affect the ultimate KV that reaches the sample. The advantage of doing this is we we get um, we have a primary beam which is of high voltage, so less influenced by um, other sort of effects. Um, you get a little higher sort of current density and brightness, um, but you do get the spatial resolution when it finally uh, interacts with the sample of a smaller KV. So when we're talking about uh, low voltage, we're getting uh, the beam going in only a few tens of nanometers. Uh, there should be less charging because we're getting less electrons uh, in the material. And the behavior of the contrast is more to do with the detector collection efficiencies, whether it be secondary or backscatter, rather than other sort of effects like the the, uh, the sample. So um, the effect you get at low KVs, you get a lot more uh, secondary electron yield. Uh, one of the important effects you see is that these uh, secondary electrons created by backscatter in the high voltage will come from a sort of larger sort of region, whereas at low voltage, you tend to get the uh, SE1s and SE2s from the same volume. You can also increase the secondary electron yield by doing tilting to some extent as well. Now, here we can see um, some uh, low KV images of a Goldman uh, carbon standard. Unfortunately, there's a lot of contamination on the standard. So you can see at 5 KV uh, at about 175,000 times, we're seeing all these sort of strands and this sort of mottling to the what should be normally sort of nice bro bright gold particles on a sort of black carbon background. But you can see at 5 kV, uh, things look kind of translucent, so this sort of webbing in between the particles. And on the particles itself, um, you can see that there's sort of um, a grayishness to them. But, you know, you can ultimately see some of them are, are fairly bright. Whereas if we go from 5 kV to 1 kV, you're getting a little less translucency to the things that are interconnecting. So we're basically doing a smaller volume of interaction here. So we're seeing a lot more sort of finer detail. Things are more solid in appearance rather than translucent. Um, and so you can pick up a lot more detail at the 1 kV. Now, if we compare um, with our Everthorne Thornley detector, um, and down here we have the uh, through the lens detector, uh, the effect of KV on the secondary electron image. You can see at high KV, um, at 20 KV, you're seeing a lot of topographical three-dimensional sort of contrast. Um, and you're losing some of the surface detail. So uh, there's a bit of aluminum, uh, a fine layer of aluminum in some of the electronic circuit here. So it starts to fade away as you go up in KV. And you can also see at lower KV, you're not getting as much of this edge contrast, so the bright edges um, that helps with the topography uh, that you see here. So lower topography. You are still getting some topography with the uh, Everhart Thorny detector just because it's positioned off to the side, so you do get a sort of uh, illumination, as it were, effect uh, from the positioning of the detector. Whereas if you look at the uh, through the lens detector, there's less of that sort of illumination effect because we're actually looking sort of directly downwards, as it were. You can also see in the uh, 1KV images that you are getting some coloration or shading contrast. Um, so you're seeing some of the 
carbon contamination sort of showing up as dark. Um, you're also seeing on the different um, uh, electronic pathways um, some contrast as well, which may be giving us an in indication of surface chemistry. So this can be related to sort of um, maybe the oxide on the surface is varying in thickness. Uh, could be that uh, we are dealing with uh, silicon surfacates here, so it could be P and N uh, different types of um, materials. So we may have, you know, different levels of doping uh, in these particular pathways. So that might be a contributing to contrast, or it could be, um, you know, the aluminum might be slightly thicker uh, in certain areas than it is in others. So. And you can see that things are a little more translucent in the 20 kV, more solid in the 1 kV. So you don't have that beam penetration effect uh, that you see. Now you can do tilting to sort of increase your secondary electron yield on things. So here we can see some nanowires that are tilted. Hey, we're talking about backscatter electron images. Um, you can see uh, fairly fine detail. So here we're up at uh, uh, 350,000 times magnification, looking at uh, some nice catalyst particles. And you can see the brighter platinum showing up um, on the base particles within the catalyst. So quite useful. Though the problem we get here um, is that the actual backscattered um, electron signal is much lower than the secondary electron signal. So we may have to use much higher current to actually get enough signal, or we may have to spend um, a very long time collecting the image. So uh, this is where uh, drift correction becomes kind of important. And you can see the nice, uh, there's a little black bar here, which indicates that we've had some drifting uh, over time, which has been corrected for. So you will see that on a number of sort of images. We've also done some beam deceleration so that we actually have a fairly low uh, landing energy on the material uh, and using a, a 2 kV beam. Uh, over here, you can see uh, this is the actual uh, contaminated uh, gold standard at 5 kV, but we're doing backscatter uh, 350,000 times, uh, but we can't really see that contamination uh, on the uh, surface of the sample. Now, one of the main reasons for doing low voltage is to get rid of charging. So the big basic issue we have is with a lot of non-conducting specimens, you're going to have uh, electrons building up in the specimen, and that's going to cause negative charging. So we have uh, electrons leaving the specimen, electrons going into the specimen. So uh, we're going to have a lot of negative charging, which is going to be the sort of bright charging you see here. Uh, if we reduce the KV, now there is a critical uh, sort of voltage where uh, with dosage um, and specimen and tilt and with uh, current magnification and scanning, uh, you can get optimization such that you get charge balance. And beyond that, you go into a dark charging re range or black charging uh, where you get uh, positive charge. And then it drops down again uh, where you have the E1 value um, to uh, back into the negative charging range. So usually for E1, it's around 50 to 150. Uh, EV. Uh, E2 for various different materials tends to be in the uh, 0.5 to 
3 kV range. Uh, some things that are a little more conductive will be a little higher than that. Um, but we really need to do this in order to avoid sort of imaging artifacts like the charging, uh, drifting, uh, which quite often can be seen uh, with the secondary electrons. And uh, we need to adjust all the different uh, parameters uh, in order to sort of optimize those. Now, when we're talking about negative charge uh, or bright charging, what you have happening there is that the um, secondary electrons from the surface um, are being repelled. Uh, so you're getting a little higher SE yield. Um, we're also having an effect on the landing energy of the incident electrons is reduced. Um, so you're going to get a little more yield because of that as well. Uh, I will also point out that um, it'll also affect your EDS because you will have a lower landing energy, so less excitation of X-rays. And also the field between the surface and the uh, secondary electron detector is increased, so this will also improve uh, detector collection efficiency. So these things sort of contribute to why things look bright. Now, on the other hand, when you have a sort of positive charge, dark charging, so uh, the areas can recollect their own secondary electron um, emission. Uh, quite often, in normal cases, uh, this can be seen uh, if you have hydrocarbons on the surface. You might get a dark square that disappears um, after you move off the area. So now, what we'd like to achieve, achieve is dynamic charge balance. So even though we may have a non-conducting sample, we want to have sort of the electrons going in versus the electrons going out sort of balance so we don't get uh, a buildup of charge. Now, sometimes you will have an effect on this E2 number for getting charge balance that may be related to the atomic number of the material. Um, the silicon, um, if you do tilt, so for silicon, if we tilt it, you can see the effect at different kV for tilting on the yield of secondary electrons, the tilt angle. So not so much of an effect when, once you get down to really low kV, but, you know, if you're in this sort of uh, 5 to 1 kV range, there is a, a, an effect that does occur. Now, um, there have been people that have done lots of experimentation to see what these uh, E2 values um, will come out like. So uh, a lot of stuff on photoresist because electronics um, and polymers are a lot of materials that there's a lot of interest in actually balancing out the charge and doing sort of imaging. But you'll have other things where um, you have different types of materials. Um, now, there will, be an there will be an influence of things like contamination or coatings on materials on the actual values you get for E2. So if you're coating chromium on glass, you will have an effect um, on things. Um, so it's something to be considered. Or if you're altering the surface in some way, um, you will also get an effect on the E2 value. And polymers, um, a lot of different values there. Uh, but you have to consider also what the surface is like. Um, and it's important. Uh, if you do have mixtures of polymers, that you may have different sort of E2 values for different areas of the sample. So if you're doing any copolymerization materials, you do will have this thing. Now, these are be considered sort of guidelines. 
on things. So one of the big problems we have is that this E2 value is affected by the angle of the electron beam hitting the sample. Uh, it can also be affected by any sort of coatings present or contamination, you know, if, there, if there's an oxide on surfaces. So the topography may affect the charging of different regions on the sample. So even though we've maybe achieved, for the most part, charge balance uh, on the material, you may have influences from different sort of surfaces. You can see sort of charging at various points. Um, and, you know, you're getting some different behavior of the uh, imaging at different points on the material. So uh, not always ideal. So you can't always have something that's perfectly flat. So sometimes you try to achieve the best you can. Uh, in the case of this image, it's at uh, 50,000 times on a ceramic material, uh, which has not been coated uh, because we wanted to see the sort of surface structures on the material. Um, so we can see quite a lot of fine detail on something that isn't coated. Now, there are a few materials where you do get um, some unusual behavior, uh, Teflon and Lumina, uh, you sometimes see at higher KV that you can actually achieve uh, a charge balance situation. Um, so sometimes you will actually see that um, at higher KV in those materials, you get a charge balance and not sort of a charging effect, so sort of the uh, lines and bands you see here. This, in this case, is graphene. So we have some graphene sheets um, on a surface, and we're getting sort of charge balance here. But if we go to lower KV, you can see that we're getting sort of bright charging. So um, it's an effect you sometimes see in some materials. Damage and contamination. You're getting a lot of, because you're focusing the beam on very small sort of areas, you're going to get a lot of, if there's a lot of carbon, um, evaporating off the sample or for some reason you don't have a very clean vacuum system um, you'll get uh, carbon squares when you focus the beam down to a sort of small area so you can see it actually is built up to, into a nice sort of square here um, so for this image uh, we're doing 2 kV uh, we're doing beam deceleration uh, we're about 100,000 times magnification. Any damage you're seeing, uh, so some materials will be sensitive to beam damage. So in case of polymers, you might be getting, um, becoming amorphous. Uh, you uh, may get in certain semiconductors some radiation damage um, at the low energy. And because you're focusing on a small sort of region, it's not going to be very extensive, but uh, it may be fairly concentrated. So um, you have to be careful with that on the material that you're sort of doing. Now, the damage um, you get sometimes won't be um, visualized. Uh, sometimes it will. So in polymers, sometimes you'll see uh, cracking effects, so it, the area will start to crack. You may see the material start to disappear. Uh, you may see some buildup of carbon uh, due to the uh, polymer being evaporated, things like that. So to help with that, sometimes, uh, especially with the carbon contamination, 
uh, you can use a cold finger in the specimen chamber to help, help tie up any um, uh, volatiles uh, that do end up in the chamber. And uh, if your sample won't be damaged or altered, you can do things like plasma cleaning of the sample surface to sort of remove uh, any sort of contaminants that might be on the surface. Now, should you coat your sample? So one of the problems with uh, putting a coating on sample is the coating may become visible. So um, if you have gold, you may see 50,000 times and above that you can see the gold coating on your sample. Uh, in the case of platinum, we're at 350,000 times. So above 100,000 times, you can see the platinum coating on a sample. Uh, if you're doing things like chromium and gold palladium, uh, you can, uh, those are a little bit less visible at higher magnifications, but uh, uh, a little more expensive to do. Um, chromium, you run into problems with oxidation of the chromium layer, so you need a good vacuum for depositing the material. And the other thing you have to consider, especially if you're going up to higher magnifications, is what effect the coating has on the dimensions of things. So uh, if we're looking at sort of mem polymer membranes, we may want to actually measure the size of these pores or actually be able to see the pores. So if I coated this with uh, 10 nanometers of, of carbon, for instance, we probably would cause most of the pores to disappear. So you've got to remember that if you're coating with uh, a certain thickness of uh, coating, to double that sort of value if we're looking at things like pores. So uh, that can be quite important. Um, so you have to be take that into consideration. Also, you might be wanting to, the whole reason you might be wanting to look at the surface of the sample is to see the surface morphology. So having a crack pattern all over the surface won't be very helpful to see what's going on there, so. Now, another thing I'll point out, quite often when we're looking at uh, things at high magnification, we're also using very short working distances as well. So um, quite commonly we'll be in a range from sort of two to four millimeters of working distance. So here we're at 2.3, here we're at uh, 1.9 uh, millimeters. So we want to be fairly close uh, to the final aperture. Uh, this also helps us if we are doing immersion mode. We can't do immersion mode if we're a long working distance away. Um, and also um, the effects of beam deceleration uh, will get a little better uh, lensing if we're doing it at a shorter working distance. Now, beam energy spread. So with field emission guns, we do have uh, two different types uh, within the uh, SEM field. So we have the thermionic or Shockley field emission types. So they'll have a certain beam of typically 0.3 to 1 EV uh, spread in the sort of energy range of the beam. Uh, whereas the cold field emission guns, you'll have a much tighter uh, uh, range, so uh, you won't have uh, as many problems with uh, chromatic aberration um, because with different sort of beam energies, uh, in the beam, you're going to get some uh, spread due to chromatic aberration. And this is going to be a problem in sort of your ultimate resolution. So one of the things we can do with the um, thermionic uh, guns is we can put in a um, uh, monochromator, or in this case, we're using uh, some nano slits 
And we're sort of in seeing the third example here with the Unicore um, uh, slit aperture design. We're sort of taking the beam off to the side and going through a slit to sort of get a narrow range of energy and going down uh, to actually scan the uh, the actual uh, sample. So we can go from the values we have here, so typically, you know, 0.7 EV down to a value of uh, 1.5 EV. So it helps us a lot with resolution. Um, and quite often when we're sort of doing imaging at very high magnifications, we'll make use of that. But it does reduce the amount of electrons you're actually looking at the sample width. So uh, you may have to spend a lot more time collecting uh, the uh, image uh, because of the sort of low signal you get. So this is why it's important to have very good detectors for detecting um, low amounts of signal in your sample. Now, um, another topic that's quite um, important when we're talking about uh, low voltage is looking at things that are beam sensitive. So in the case of photoresist, you don't want to necessarily um, expose the photoresist to uh, high KV. Uh, you may be wanting to later on actually do something with it. Um, so you want to keep the KV very low. Uh, depending on the type of photoresist, you may have to uh, be below uh, 1 KV all the time. Um, in this case of this photoresist, it's a little bit gold decorated just to improve uh, the imaging. You can see the gold particles on the photoresist. So, uh, 50,000 times at 1 kV, um, the photoresist is this layer here on top of the silicon. Uh, and um, so you can see uh, fairly relatively sharp images of things at 200,000, but we're only at 500 uh, volts. A lot of the um, high resolution or high magnification imaging we usually do with the through the lens detector because we can do uh, immersion mode um, and also because we get a little better resolution than the uh, the actual um, Everhart Thornley detector so uh, quite useful to have a through-the-lens detector if you're going to be doing any sort of low-voltage work. Uh, another thing that's uh, quite often when you're looking at polymers, you don't necessarily want to coat them. You may want to look at some of the surface detail. Uh, quite often, though, it's just that there's a lot of charging that's going on. So here we have some... Uh, uncoated uh, polymer. Um, we're doing a lot of work these days on mask materials, so uh, looking at some of the uh, polymers within the material. We don't want to necessarily put in a lot of um, energy because uh, we do run into issues with, you can actually sometimes see the uh, polymer melting in the SEM if you use too high KV. And here we're doing very low KV, so 500 volts. We're doing enough, you know, uh, enough beam deceleration, so we're getting the actual amount of uh, electrons actually hitting the sample down to almost uh, zero, down to about 100 EV. So we're not having uh, the effects we would normally have with higher KV beams. We are still getting maybe a little bit of charging around the particle. Uh, here on the surface. So uh, it's not going to be a long presentation today, so 
uh, just going to give some references for things. So uh, Goldstein's book on scanning microscopy and x-ray microanalysis is very useful for reading. Uh, the Australians have a nice uh, website. Um, the link might be a little bit old. I, I think they've, they're doing an update to their website with considering COVID-19 um, and people doing a lot of stuff from home. Uh, but this has a lot of information about um, SEM, EDS, things like that. You'll also see some other techniques uh, covered there. Uh, Casino um, is a uh, nice uh, thing if you need to do um, Monte Carlo simulations. You will probably also find some other people that have done some uh, versions of Monte Carlo simulation programs that you can use for doing sort of things. Very useful uh, for figuring out, especially if you're doing EDS, uh, your interaction volume. Uh, David Joy um, is probably the world expert on um, low voltage scanning electron microscopy. Uh, his sort of basic uh, paper uh, from 1996 on low voltage scanning electron microscopy is basically the uh, go to guide. He does have a nice um, sort of um, flowchart view of sort of the steps to go when you're trying to get that sort of E2 value optimized. So, I mean, the E2 values you've seen back on the uh, the table I displayed um, on earlier. So these things you should sort of use as sort of a guideline. You may want to start at a little lower KV than the suggested values and play around with the current. So quite often we're doing fairly low currents with things. Um, you may notice on some of the things, so for instance, on this particular image, we're at 6.3 picoamps of current. So we're at very low current uh, when we're doing imaging, and we're also at fairly short working distance, so 2.2 in this case at 1 kV. So uh, please ask questions, um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope this has been informative. I would really recommend uh, that you have a look at um, uh, David Joy's paper. Uh, it's uh, quite useful. It's also the uh, paper that a lot of other work on low voltage scanning electron microscopy is based. And uh, David Joy has given a lot of input to uh, papers since then uh, on uh, low voltage SEM. Okay, thank you. Great, um, thank you, Chris. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. I'm um, just going through quickly. I don't see any questions that have arrived yet. Well, so I, I do not mind if you email me at butcher at mcmaster.ca if you want to um, ask me any questions about low voltage that comes uh, to mind later on. So uh, we're hearing a lot of clicking from Sam. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. That's no problem. Uh, so There is one question that came in, Chris. Oh, okay. Um, could this method be used for differentiation of semiconductors with different doping levels? Yes. So uh, if we zip back up – so the contrast you're seeing here in these sort of bands within the electronic structure could be due to NNP doping. 
uh, in the silica. Uh, you'll see in the David Joy paper, he shows um, a very old example of uh, something that Doug Perovic did on a cross-section of uh, NNP uh, silicon. So yes, it's quite useful for that. The problem becomes, is the coloration due to something other like oxide thickness or, you know, contamination? That's where the issue really comes in. If you have a very clean sample and you're very sure that you don't have uh, anything else on the surface, yes, you can uh, see the N and P doping in things. Uh, it's been clearly demonstrated. Now, the reason it happens uh, is because of, you know, the modification of the emission of, uh, so the, the sort of work function of the material. So you, uh, the emission you get is different for different sort of levels of doping, whether it becomes N or P.